All right. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you happen to be in the world as you're listening to us today. Um, boy, I'm excited. I'm super excited. I can still see people streaming in. Uh, we're going to have a big group today to hear from this esteemed, awesome panel of experts here um, that I gathered because each of you has a unique perspective on the business and on the industry. And I thought it would be really fun to get us all together and talk about predictions for 2023. So can we just go quickly around the room? I'm pretty sure everybody knows everybody. Um, just quickly, I'm Allison Ball and I'm the marketing director at Lysio. I also, my team also leads the Grove, which is platform agnostic. It has very little to do with, with Lysio. Um, and that's why we gathered people here today on the Grove. So David, I'm just going to go around. I'm going to go counterclockwise here, and you're on my Brady Bunch to the left. Okay. I'm David Leary. I'm the host of the Cloud Accounting Podcast. I uh, was at Intuit for most like 22 years. Uh, since then, I've taken an entrepreneur journey, and part of that journey is now I'm a client of a couple different accounting firms. So oh. like, I'm experiencing this industry from a whole different perspective now Both than I had sides. before. Yeah. <laughs> Both sides. All right, Andrew, I'm going to take you next. Sure. Uh, my name is Andrew Wall. I have a firm up here in the Great White North in Toronto, Ontario. Uh, we have a very niche specialization in IT consultants, uh, and we have a firm of about 20 people. Um, and I'm always excited about new tech and new toys. So really excited about what technology is bringing for 2022. Yeah, yeah, super excited. And I'm also Canadian, so happy to have another Canadian on the call here. Don, you're up next. All right, right on. Uh, I'm Dawn Brolin. I'm the designated motivator and I own a firm, Powerful Accounting. There's uh, three of us. We have three in the firm. That's plenty for me. And uh, also an author and hosting podcasts and really um, enjoying. I'm so honored to be here with all of you guys. So I'm super pumped to be here. We're really lucky to have all of you. Um, Nicole, so I was teasing earlier that you've upped our fashion game, but there's other, you are actually known for having a CPA firm and being an expert as well. Yes, I'm Nicole Davis. I have a firm here um, in Congress, Georgia, which is right outside of Atlanta. We have a team of nine in-house and we have three full-time offshore team members. And for on the accounting side, we serve mostly pharmacies, construction companies, entertainers, and media companies. On the payroll side, we serve a, a lot of different industries. So great. Well, thank you so much for joining. And Jason, last but not least. I'm just going in the order of the of the the Brady no, Bunch. I get it. I get yeah. it. It's fine. Uh, I'm Jason. Uh, I run a team of 40 or so in Oregon and make content for accountants on Twitter and YouTube. Yeah. And you also have a community that people can join as well. Do you want to give your shout out for your community? I do. I've got a community for firm runners called RealizeRLZ.io. Right. We'll give that link as, as well. Yeah. And Logan is saying youngest is last. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not even going to go about how old everybody is. That age is irrelevant. Age is just a number, Logan. So that's you're only you. young that's once, right. but you can be immature forever. That's right. You can be <laughs> immature forever, <laughs> which is a me. Absolutely. So let's get started about, so 2023, um, lots of distressing news right now about layoffs and p people being worried about the tech talent. I mean, the talent in the industry, can you get enough people, people leaving leaving the industry. David, you were talking about how many how many accountants had led the industry. Um, I mean, sorry, had left the industry and what you're kind of what you were thinking about. And you actually even predicted, I want to start with something uh, pretty, pretty hefty to begin with. You actually predicted a meltdown in the in the accounting industry. So can we start with that? Because I'd love to get the the attend the 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 attendees and get everybody also fired up. Everybody fired up. Well, I was shocked. I was like, oh, wow, I'm really hoping there isn't a meltdown. So when you said that, what was on your mind? I mean, it, things have been stacking up, right? Uh, we have a shortage of late. There's not enough accountants. There's not enough new people going to accounting. Accounting graduates are all-time lows. Salaries are stagnant, right? People starting salaries are basically what they were a decade ago, 15 years ago. Um, you have a lot of firms on old technology stacks. And so and this all of a sudden, it really hit home last week, even after I posted this prediction. Um, like, I got fired by a firm because, because they you, have too many as clients. A, as, right? a client, as a client, got, as so a client, I got so let you, go. So that entity of yours, because you have multiples, is now yes. an orphan. Well, it was we're going to talk about orphan my personal return. Well. Yeah, my personal return. But yeah, so, so this is real. This like firms mm -hmm. having too much work 
and not enough bodies to do it. It's starting, it's hitting home personally, you know, Mm -hmm. but then you look at like the Southwest mess from three weeks ago and you start understanding it better. It's the same problems, not enough pilots, poor computer Mm -hmm. system on the back end, uh, flight attendants working too many hours. It's, you could just take the word Southwest out of there, flight attendant pilots um, and passengers and replace with uh, tax preparer, a client, accounting firm, and it's the exact same article. Right. You just swap right. us out. And then you have, uh, then the week mm-hmm. later, what the FAA has a big problem and just swap FAA for IRS. Like, are we in the brink of a big collapse, right? Where, where what do you guys thousands think? of returns don't get done. Yeah. What do you guys think? I mean, I don't know. I, I Andrew, you've got a, oh, I, Don. Yeah. Right. Let's I'll go let Don first go first and then Don. Okay, okay Don, let's go you. Yep. Yeah, I, I'm just, you know, I, I totally, have obviously 100% agree with David. And I think that as I'm looking at it, the swing where we used to, a lot of accountants, I guess I should say, were really afraid of losing clients. That was, has, has been kind of a mantra in the accounting industry for a long time where I don't want to collaborate with you because you're going to steal my client or those kind of things. And I think it's going to be a total opposite where I see exactly what David's saying is like, can only do so much. And so we always talk about niche and find your niche or niche, whatever. And, and it's like now more than ever, find that niche because I want to give, you know, Timothy Wingate, for instance, I sent him over a big construction client. I don't want that construction client. I want to send that over to Timothy and let him handle that. I see more collaboration due to exactly what David's saying than we've ever seen before. And that means you've got to define who are you going to be? Mm-hmm. And because you need to make sure everybody knows that you're the best at this so that we can refer you over. Right. So collaboration is going to become a really important like collaboration. Um, Andrew, I'm going to hit you, hit you up next. And then Nicole, you were talking about um, orphan clients and, and, and really working together with CPA firms. So I want, I'd like you to get, get your comment ready next after we hear from Andrew. Yeah, well, and I think also, I think um, Nicole had also mentioned something about the rise of small firms. Uh, mm-hmm. If it wasn't Nicole, it was someone else <clears> in the thread. <throat> and I think that that's one of the big differences that you see in the accounting world versus this analogy to the airline industries, is there's a lot more of these smaller firms that are taking on control, and they're a lot more agile, and a lot more, they have a better ability to adapt to new technology and to pivot and to change. And I think that's yeah. one of the big fundamental differences between that analogy. Uh, but I also think that, you know, Don, you rightly pointed out that it is a shift in the way people are thinking about their book of business now from a scarcity mindset to this abundance mindset where I've got way more work than I ever wanted. Um, where I think people are still struggling is we've always talked about the work-life balance. And I think there's very, very few of us who are truly achieving that. Yeah. And, and even though we've got all these amazing technologies that I'm sure we're going to talk about that have improved our efficiencies, it really hasn't changed our workloads. And in fact, I was listening to an article earlier that was an article from 100 years ago that was talking about how you know electricity was going to change our world and increase our efficiency. And we'd only be working four hours a week because of this new amazing technology called electricity, which absolutely did change the world, right? And it increased productivity by 5x, right? Or 10x or whatever it was. But people's lives didn't fundamentally change. All it did was extend the workday, didn't it? It just made really? it longer. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and we are finding that with the new technology too, right? Mobile phones yeah. and being available anywhere. We often find ourselves working on vacation and working and not being able to disconnect yeah especially as owners of the business, right? We're the last ones to be able to disconnect. So I don't think the accounting industry is going to collapse by any stretch of the imagination, but I do think that we're on the precipice of some really significant change. Really big change, yeah. But I think it's really up to us as our business owners ourselves to make the decision on where our path is going to go. And we're going to have to fight the urge to work harder and work longer. And, you know, because, you know, Certainly here in Toronto and in many of the major cities, there's a big rat race where you always feel like you just got to be working, you got to be hustling, you got to be grinding. When is enough enough, right? Like, I know everyone here is comfortable. We probably don't need to make any more money, but yet we still drive and none of you are working four hour work. I can guarantee you that. (laughs) Yeah. And by the way, in the in the chat, people are asking if there's a hashtag. Let's use hashtag predictions, hashtag the Grove. And then that way the growth can can bring everybody back to we can we'll be able to find it. 
So hashtag predictions, hashtag the growth, separate hashtags, uh, if you're sharing this on Twitter. So Nicole, I'm gonna ask you about sort of orphan clients and what you think is gonna happen. And then Jason, I'm gonna throw the ball over to you and we're gonna talk, start, on, I'll start up talking about tech. So where we think that we can, you know, get these efficiencies that we're gonna need. So Nicole, when you said that that it was gonna be the, the harvest, um, can you tell us what your concept of the harvest was? And I loved that metaphor. And just if you could just explain what was in your mind when you said that. Yeah, sure. Okay, so yeah, when we started this new year, um, immediately we started getting inquiries from um, businesses, local businesses, individuals in our area. And the general thing was they didn't, they weren't leaving their tax pro or CPA because they were unhappy. They were forced to leave because the person died, right? Or the person just outright retired and didn't have any oh, place for them. So to go. aging out. So mm -hmm. that was a big thing. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. Yeah. And stressing out. And yes, stressing exactly. out. Yeah. Exactly. So they, they completely mm -hmm. left the industry. So, and, and someone mentioned that before people got, or firms got rid of clients because they, they were either bad clients or PETA clients. Now people are getting rid of clients because they just can't, they don't have the capacity to serve yeah. you. Hello, hello. I was not a PETA client. Oh, I don't know if you were a PETA client. Or I don't know. But exactly your point, right? I, I, I paid decent money. Like this is, mm -hmm. this is the issue of the bigger industry. And I'm, I'm kind of glad it happened to me because it helps facilitate this discussion. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So, so to me, harvest time. So it goes back to where, you know, you, you plant, you water, you reap, you sow, you sow reap. So yep. for me, it's like now there's this uh, a market full of orphan clients and small firms and solopreneurs, solo firms are positioned to go out and now gather up the harvest right. because these clients don't have anywhere to go and they want a quality provider. It's interesting that they looked out for another service provider because they're used to working with an industry expert. They don't want to use TurboTax. They don't want to use any of these softwares that is DIY. So they're looking for someone to serve them, cater to them, to provide the quality of service that they were used to experiencing when they work with a different professional. So. so these are good clients. Yeah. One of the things I've been thinking about is, um, oh, there's a funny uh, comment in the chat there. David is an orphan client and a room full of accountants don't want to adopt him. That's actually not true. There are people no. who volunteered. Y'all know how to get in touch with David if you want to pick him up as a client. Um, but um, one of the things, so so let's turn to Jason. So you have a pretty large team. So are you, are you, how is your team thinking about um, capacity and and how are you leveraging? I know you're like on the very sort of bleeding edge of making chat GPT do things that were like, unbelievably fascinating. Um, how are you guys, think, how are you discussing in your Realize um, uh, community and in your firm yourself, capacity issues and staffing? Was this hit home for you? Are you guys at the point where you're turning away clients? Oh yeah, I, yeah, I think everybody is. Um, the The technology help can't come soon enough. Like I'm always, I'm always surprised when, when people um, in our space don't I like we ought to be the biggest cheerleaders for our yeah. tech vendors and for AI and all of these things because it just can't come soon enough. Um, not only for for how much need there is out there and access of what we can do for them, but like Andrew said, just for our own well-being. Yeah. Um, so things are it's, you know, if if I think if you'd asked somebody three years ago, how do you keep up with software, they would have said, there's just so much like it's just how do I keep up app overload I think was what was what the term was right yep. people felt that they were overloaded yeah and that's like 5x this year like and mm -hmm. so so AI the fact that you've got AI doing new things and these platforms that developers can leverage to pull AI into existing products and create new products like just the the pace at which it's all happening is really hard especially um Nicole, I think you you touched on the agility of smaller firms. Like at a firm like mine of uh, forty people, that's a bit like that feels to me like a big ship to steer. It, like it, it is a big it is a big ship, and I would have would posit, uh, Jason, that your firm is bigger than most firms that are here that are on this on this call. So, yeah. um, I know I was delighted when you said yes because you've got a completely different perspective. Yeah. So how are you guys handling the the tech that you? How are you sort of learning about and figuring out which ones you want to roll out? And Andrew, I know you're going to want to jump in because you love tech. And Don, you've got a prescribed tech stack. So everyone's got something to say about tech. So we're shifting over to tech, folks. So 
Well, what you, what you hope, I think, is that the vendors you've already hitched your wagon to are paying attention and pulling this stuff into the product. Mm -hmm. So communications is like the really the low hanging fruit right now and how to. So that's where that Lysio, a little shout out for Lysio. We're leading on that one for sure. And AI is, is, is absolutely coming in that for sure. Yep. But so yeah, lean hope, on. Mm -hmm. So I think you hope you hope it, it gets pulled into the products you already use. I think the other thing to explore is through the lens of delegation. Uh, when you're delegating tasks, um, the sort of stuff that you would normally give to an intern, those are probably the things first that you're going to be able to pull in more general intelligence AI into, stuff into, to help you yeah. with. Yeah, or RPA as well. I think that's another one that that is is almost ready. Um, so Andrew, I want to cut actually Andrew and Dawn, I, well, whoever wants to jump in do, but Andrew, yeah. I know you've got a course on the Grove for uh, RPA. So yeah. it's our first foray into that. You want to talk just really quickly about that and what that solves, like just super fast. And yeah. and to, to Jason's point about what you would have given to a junior employee, right? Because what that that particular workflow is literally replacing, as I understand, something that a more junior person would do. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that workflow, I tried to take a really simple really narrowed down process to make it a little bit more digestible, which was just something as simple as, you know, Jason, you've got a firm of 40, whenever we're, we've got a team we're managing, we've got to be able to follow up and make sure the tasks are being, that are, have been delegated are being completed, right? Uh, it's unfortunately one of the things you have to do once you start managing people. And so one of the things I, I love about QBO is the dashboard, it tells you, you know, when bank feeds are broken and, you know, how many outstanding transactions there are, but I hate that you can't really sort it. And I hate that, you know, you uh, also, you know, can't link it to any other data. So one of the things I did is just created an RPA uh, task using uh, Microsoft Power Automate that goes in, first goes to the client page. So every client on my dashboard, it goes to their page, updates their dashboard, so I'm getting the latest number of transactions, then pulls that dashboard down into a Excel file uh, that I can actually then sort and run pivot tables after. So I can see, okay, this bookkeeper has this many outstanding transactions and this bookkeeper has this many clients with this many broken feeds just so that I can better manage it. But we're able to use RPA in a lot of different ways that we can take um, any sort of repetitive mundane task that was done typically by people um, and just automate that. And so one I just did right now that we ran because we're in um, payroll season. So we have to create all our uh, T4s, um, which is like your 1099s. Um, or sorry, your W-2s. W-2s, yep. And uh, they have to be created by the end of February. So one of the things that we need to do is go onto our CRA website and download all the reports for all these clients. So I created an a automated RPA task uh, that went online and downloaded these reports for 420 of our clients. And that normally, so that took the RPA tool 17 hours to run. But I literally started it at five o'clock when I left to go to take my kids uh, to his hockey game on Friday, to his uh, hockey game. Yep. And when I woke up on Saturday morning, it was done. It was done. Yeah. And that, so it was I like an design... overnight thing that you just didn't even have to worry about. But once you got that flow right, yeah. 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 And that's it's just the tip of the iceberg. Unfortunately, one of the things, and I think someone else pointed out rightly so, is that with RPA, um, it is something that can and will break. Um, yeah. And you have to have, you know, some knowledge of how the process works. I know some people are sort of outsourcing it. But what are you going to do if you outsource that and that breaks? Are you going to bring back in that company to fix it? it? To me, is a skill that you need to teach to your team. And to me, in my opinion, RPA is a skill that I think yeah. every accountant needs to have and needs to know how to be able to use or this partner tool. or partner with someone who does. Like I think, I think that's the thing. Like I, when I was watching your course, I was thinking. This this is something I could master, but I was thinking, am I interested in doing that? Probably no, but I do know people who are really super techie and would want to do it, right? Yeah. So and you might want to have just, the same thing for AI, right? Sorry. Yeah, one team member's focus on it would be sufficient, yeah. but you need to have that part of your firm. And AI, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think it's the same thing. And for me, like I think the three big areas that I'm focusing in on this year are RPA, AI, because API has just been wow, uh, my mind has been blown with what you can do with chat GPT. Mm -hmm. uh, and then learning management, because if you are going to run a team and you are going to manage a team, you have to be focused on educating and training them. That's right. And so you need to be building out those processes. That's right. That's right. So let's shift a little to um, to work like you, you all had mentioned work-life balance, pretty much all of you. 
And um, so how are you guys thinking about that in your firms this year? Don, I'm going to start with you because you are like famous for the 35 hour week. Yeah. And so do you think that this is going to be, my question is bigger than like, if you if you want to share how you do it, no problem. But my question for the rest of you is going to be, do you think that this is going to be something that firms are going to have to focus on this year in order to maintain and attract talent? So so let's start with Don, and then I'm going to, we'll just jump around. Yeah, I mean, in mo a lot of people do know my story, some don't, I'm not going to go through the whole story, but it, I got to a point where I was like, why is this totally taking over my life? Mm -hmm. Why do I, I'm not, I don't want to be the 80 hour, you know, honor badge of working 80 hours a week. And so I, I made a shift to do, to coach college softball during tax season. And because I made that decision for me personally, it was a selfish moment is the way I kind of look at it. I was like, you know what? I need to take care of me. And so I knew if I was going to work nine to two or, you know, I'd get crazy and work eight to two or nine to three, depending on when practice was, or there's days where I have, I'm gone for the whole day because there's games. I knew I had to implement a tech stack that could work while I wasn't there. I had, I had to be able to have mm -hmm. integrated technologies because we're only a firm of three. You know, uh, and I know um, Jason and Andrew even people who maybe have a lot more clients than we do. And we've made the shift to say not only so I did that implemented the technology and that's been beautiful the integrations entering something in Lysio and have it dump into QBO dump into carbon and then have my ability to grab ignition to go ahead because it's grabbing from QBO like everything is syncing by one data point entry. So my administrative staff yeah. are doing less work. And so they're able to, she's able to, she's semi-retired. She's able to do the thing she wants. Nicole on my team, she wants to be able to do the thing she wants to do. And we went to the relationship pricing this year. We're a hundred percent on relationship pricing and it allows us to have more control. We have our cash flow. We don't even think about cash flow anymore. And so because we're doing those things, I just decided I was going to be selfish and do my own thing. And the technology is the reason I can do it. Because without that, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm just clicking buttons and I, now yeah. I'm down to not the hours. Now it's the number of clicks that I do. I want to have less clicks and more action without clicking. And Hector's, <laughs> Hector's tool is all about that. His right tool is about yep. reducing, reducing clicks on QBO. 100%. Yeah. And, and yeah. I just, I, what I wish and hope for and why I wrote the book, the designated motivator for accounting professionals is all because I want everyone to have what they see to be the best firm for them and their team. Yep. And I see this year because of supply is up, supply is, wait, demand is up and supply is down. Supply being us. We supply, the supply is way down. Supply is way down yes. for the reasons that Nicole said with people actually dying. I hadn't really thought about dying and retiring. And then David brought it up in one of the earlier chats we had about, you know, people just leaving the profession and then and, we all know that folks aren't, 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 there's a perception issue on the, on the, the, the industry right now that it's not fun, which is, I hate that there's this perception industry, you know, perception of that. So new people aren't joining as much as they are. Yeah. yeah. I just want to say that I believe that this is a shit. This is like, I get all fired up. This is a shift in the accounting industry like we will we have never seen before in that you all of you on this call have the ability and the power now to dictate what your firm's going to look like because you're not going to be worried about clients you shouldn't be worried about what you're pricing price at your value because if you lose a client i've had this happen and i get so crazy i'm like oh they removed me from their qbo file what? Tracy, take them, make them no longer a client. We're done with those guys. And it's not because I didn't like the people, but, but I, I just, I don't have that. Oh no. I used to have the panic and the stomach and the, in the yeah. throat. I don't have that anymore. I'm like, oh, that's too bad. You know, I really liked working with that person, but I'm not desperate anymore. And those of you who, this is your time to define your firm and make changes and make it be what you want it to be more right. than ever before. Just want to say that. I have a David, question that kind of ties and, yeah, the time shortage. In and then we're going to take some of the questions from the from the Q and A. So yeah. put your questions and, in, folks. And this is like a question kind of for the rest of the panelists. So obviously, accountants, your firm, everybody's staffs working sixty hours a week, right? Everybody's firing clients, getting that capacity down. Now you have your employees at forty hours a week, but how do you actually have make time for your staff to work and do implement new technologies and change the firm? Do you really need to? take your capacity down to 30 hours a week so you have that extra elbow room. Because yeah. I feel like people are 
they're they're getting rid of clients, but they're not they're they're solving for the short term, but they're not actually. I feel like you'd almost have to get rid of half your clients to give you time to reinvent your whole yeah, entire firm, then not, start taking clients again. Like, how are you know, guys all handling that? Well, you also need to know like where you're where you're spending your time. And so what's really interesting is you really need to understand, like Thomson Reuters did a study, it was like 2021, and, and accounting web published it, that accountants and bookkeepers spend 40% of their time just gathering and searching for documents. So I would start there. I would start at that 40%. Jason, you're laughing. Come off mute and, and challenge me. But they are spending, so if you're spending all that time doing that, if that is true, you know, then that would be the place I would start. So Jason. You're laughing. Yeah, no, and it's it's completely true. And ta tax accountants are the exact same. Um, sending out a really low effort organizer at the end of the year, and then the client gives you half the docs, and then in your in your busiest season, you're building a list of all the things that you need for them. Yeah. Um, you know, a more intelligent information requesting is like the cornerstone of our profession right now. It's what we need most. Mm. Um, and we've I, I think in the last five years we've made great steps uh in the right direction with practice management with communication layers like Lysio like I think we're getting there mm -hmm. yeah we're really getting there when we can make the clients and what's really going to be interesting is like firms that embrace these like the, I think as a firm owner you really seriously need to know where your team is spending your time and then take steps to 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 and then talk to people and say how have you solved this problem because they, I think they really fall into buckets of, you know, and to David's point, you can't roll out any new technology unless you're freeing up some capacity to do that. But I think a way to do that is to, to identify a champion. You free up the time of that person. They lead it. So there, there's some there's some things that you can do. Yeah. Allison, um, can jump in real quick. Yeah, absolutely. Happen in the chat here. And I love that because people are like, well, how do you get down to working 30, 35 hours a week? And, and Jennifer in here is like, we do four days a week year round. Here's what the problem is. We can be busy. Everybody can be busy. But can you be productive? When you put constraints on your time and you say, and you commit to something, now I'm crazy. I do softball, co college softball coaching. But if I'm committed to coaching softball at three o'clock, I need to be a practice at like 20 of three. I know if I get in the office, I only have until 20 of three. When you have an endless clock and you don't have restrictions in what we call boundaries, if you don't have boundaries around your practice, anyone can work 80 hours a week. But is that being productive and is it being profitable? Because produ productivity means profitability. Being busy is just being busy. And so yeah. I, I think it's really just make a decision that I'm going to work four days a week, or I'm going to work these, these are going to be my hours and set boundaries. I've never yep. been more productive than I have in the last three years. And, you know, and no is a complete sentence too. Yes. Yes. No. Right. So don't take, <laughs> don't take on clients that you think it, it are a bad fit, you know, and that's, so let's turn, let's turn to, let's turn to some of the questions in the chat. Cause there's some pretty good ones. Um, I'm not answering them in the order that I'm not asking them in the order they came in, but Wayne has an interesting one. What do you see in the future for the saleability of practices if there's so little supply? I'd love to chime in on that because I love that question because it's around succession planning. And around succession planning, I think there will be people like Jason's firm who he's got a large firm. He may want to be, you know, there are people out there who are growing and they want to grow. What the key for all, every single one of us is what does our firm look like when we're ready to sell? Do you have file cabinets in your office? And eh, take a hundred grand off your price easily right there. Do, do you have integrated systems? Woohoo! You're going to sell your firm for more. If you have it under control, you have good employees that like, you've got great clients, you've got revenue, you're going to be able to sell for more. The succession planning is so, so critical because nobody wants to buy a junk car. They want to buy a really nice old Mustang, 1982 Mustang. That's what they want to buy. They want to buy, buy your trash. Yeah. But I love the question because I think that that's so important. But I think there are going to be people that we probably have not even met yet who are going to come and gobble up all of those, you know, five, 10, 15 years from now, when we're ready to sell, I think there's going to be people out there a hundred percent. Anybody want to challenge what Don said or, or, or agree? Well, I think there, there's clearly, there's still the large companies are still acquiring. There's mm -hmm. lots of people interested in acquiring. And I'd say right now, there's probably more people interested in acquiring than are actually selling right now. Uh, the question is going to become what's the multiple um, will it hover around the one times earnings? Will people get these 4X and 7X that people are talking about because they've moved to monthly recurring revenue? 
I think some of that is overhyped as far as what these multiples that people talk about, about what you're going to get on exit. Um, and I think that there will always be someone out there willing to buy an accounting practice. Uh, and it's just going to be a, a function of what the multiples will be. And the multiples will, again, come back to what Don points out about, about well, what are the efficiencies of this firm, right? Because, you know, whatever the multiple is, everyone knows that ultimately the sale of a practice comes down to what do I think I'm going to be able to generate with that new business or that book of business? Can I get mm -hmm. some efficiencies out of what I'm already doing? Um, so some people might be interested in a firm that's, you know, still got filing cabinets because they think they can increase the profitability and the returns on that. So they see some synergies of bringing that into their firm. Or it's a talent or it could be a talent, like an, an aqua hire. It right. could be an aqua hire, yeah. Yeah. Nicole, you're you're nodding. Are you do you have some do you agree or disagree with this? No, I was definitely agreeing with um Andrew and Don in that I think for especially this from a smaller firm's perspective, I think a lot of people don't realize that the succession plan for these smaller firms is die at your desk, right? So they're not thinking about succession planning the way these bigger firms are thinking oh. about them. And so I know it's 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 morbid, but it's the truth because I mean it's it, sad. It's it sad. is very sad. So I think and we got to figure out how to solve that issue because again, these smaller firms, um, they're, they're probably not uh, in the best shape to be sold to these bigger firms. But however, that's why we start thinking about collaborating with these, with each other now and say, okay, how can we yeah. put our firms together to collaborate? We're two separate entities still, but we're still figuring out how we can get synergies from each firm as we're working together so that eventually the one firm could absorb the other firm. So we have less of the dying at the decks versus, you know, doing pl planning for it now versus later. Yeah, there's but a new term. Sorry, David, just a second. There's a new yeah. term that I learned this year called co-firming. Have you guys heard of this? So it's, I'm not, I don't have a full understanding of it, but um, Dave Kirsting is doing this with another firm. He is co-firming. And um, I think this is something, if anybody knows anything about this, I could just a miss actually not to get Dave on here because he could have explained it. Um, but I think to me, it sounded like, like the ultimate collaboration and a way around, you know, you do this and I do this and we can work together and support each other. But I'm guessing I need to learn more about that. David, well, over to you. I, I was going to say that the reason these orphan clients exist is because those those firms were not valuable to buy. So these people just finally just close their doors. They're they can't sell their firm because in, in what people are acquiring, they it's talent. They're not acquiring clients. The talent, they're acquiring your staff because it's easier to buy your firm mm -hmm. than it so is to do that. Yep. But I, I think Scott Scorano said it best is like the, the one simple, it, all this could be one measurement. All you have to do is like, well, Don's working 70 hours a week. Jason's working 20 hours a week as a firm owner. The, obviously, Jason has systems and processes and technologies and tools and a good staff. I'm going to buy that firm. So you can really probably measure your multiple of your firm based it's opposite of how many hours you're working, right? If you can build a firm where you're not working in your firm anymore, that's well, probably the that's highest a sellable possible. firm, isn't that's it? That's a sellable firm. Jason, but then you don't do you want think? to sell it. That, yeah. Jason, yeah. what do you think? Is that ringing true for you? I Honestly, I'm generally like a pessimist on firm selling. And I think oftentimes it's it uh, takes the focus off of what, matters most which is building a sustainable firm a sustainable um, firm. yeah and just like i've i've lived through the experience of large groups buying small firms it burns the people it burns the clients 90 percent of the yeah. time i've talked with a lot of the 10 to 100 employee firms who are selling or try to sell and a lot of them would tell you 1.2 is a pipe dream so like i don't i don't like i think the notion of like many x multiples even on fixed recurring revenue like it just doesn't happen right now mm -hmm. um what I'd love to do is think about what's going to be the best legacy for my team that I've built and my clients that I've built. And for me, that looks more like, how do I make this sustainable for me for like two years longer? And then, and then the firm goes to my team. I'm, I'm financially more or less where I would have been otherwise. Mm -hmm. And that seems like enabling the greatest likelihood of success for my team and for the clients, as opposed to like, staking everything and oh i hope when i get there somebody will be willing to buy it uh like the former just feels i don't know more healthier to me yeah it's an interesting thing to to sort of dig into your own why right like simon Sinek always says you know start with why what is your why like why are you doing this right now across the board when i talk to 
accounting professionals of all different types, you know, tax, bookkeeping, CAS, it doesn't matter what you do, you, um, IRS reps, doesn't matter. They all have really big hearts. And so the desire to help is really big, like really big. There's very few that are just like, oh, I'm doing it for the money. Um, one or two, but I've never, I've really literally in the past few years have not talked to anybody who's doing it for the money. They're doing it more for, to help people and then getting really clear on the why. So Jason, I think your why is really, I'm building something here for my team and there's enough, I will know, I, Jason will know when I've got enough and then I will, you know, and so having that idea in your mind, Don, for you, it's like, I want to have a sustainable, you know, that word sustainable, I think comes on. I want to have a sustainable life. I want to be able to give back by doing the, um, you know, Andrew, you're building an incredible firm with tech so that your team can get the right things done, right? And work on the right things and have that joy all day. Um, you know, David, you're educating, um, you know, the whole world, really. Um, Nicole, I'm not sure on your why. I'm going to put you on the, put you on the, on the, on the, um, on the spot here. Do you know, what is your, what would you say is your, your why for your firm? You know, I always, when people ask me this question, it all goes back to my dad. Um, he died in 2016, but he, when I came out of college, he started an um, auto repair shop. And I was working for um, a Fortune 500 company. I've never worked in public. I've always worked for industry. And one day I just, I was like, hey, why am I helping these big companies get bigger when I can help people like my dad and smaller yeah. companies get better. Oh. So for me, it was definitely more of a family decision. Like, so I mm -hmm. quit my job. I went in to business with my dad, helped him until I eventually started my firm on my own over time. So for me, my wife definitely, it was definitely my dad, but then I also yeah. just like helping these companies get better because no, like these big companies are going to get bigger regardless. Right. So we need more advocates for the small businesses um, just to, to yeah. be there. Yeah, and that's a great a great lob over to. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to say the right the, pronounce the first name right. Argel, um, accounting tech industry is eventually going to consolidate through acquisitions. As accounting professionals, how can we predict which ones will survive, and how can we ensure we're not the ones holding the short end of the stick, i.e., data features, processes, process gone, and firms having to adapt to these changes? So sounds like like our Argel is thinking that accounting in, you know, tech is going to, is just going to consign accounting, the accounting tech industry is going to consolidate. So are you guys I, worried about your apps consolidating into other apps? I guess is how I'm kind of reading just this. Disappearing one day or disappearing, <laughs> which has um, happened. David, you I, probably have the best commentary on this. Or Don, well, let's go to Don first. Don, what were you, are you worried about this? I'm not worried about it. What, what I, what the, the I would say I'm concerned for others more than anything, because everybody likes a bright, shiny penny. Everybody likes to look at a bright, shiny penny. I prefer quarters, but you know, whatever, whatever your choice and coins are, but I'm more concerned about those because it's like Andrew was saying, the AI, API and be able to get into things that there's more that will come your way, but what are the ones that are going to stick? And that's really important. If you have an app that is developing, constantly developing, I'm less worried about one acquiring another as long as the solution is still working or the solution may be. But for me, it's more of the shiny pennies that come in and we're sitting there going, oh, I want to go try that when what you're using is working. Why are you? Because it's a shiny penny. So that's probably more of my concern. I'm not worried about, about you know, mergers and acquisitions on that as long as the tech itself sticks. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I work with reputable, I'm always a reputable yep. company, a reputable app on people that, you know, I get to know the people and I listen and I watch, are they growing? Are they staying the same? Are they turning over a lot of people? Mm -hmm. Those kind of things that you've got mm -hmm. to keep in mind, not just the technology, because there are people that come in and you're right, Andrew, hundred percent, they come in, they swoop through at a conference and then they're gone and they've, you've disrupted your process over a yeah. shiny so DC David, backed you, with big money think? to spend and they yeah. fizzle out real fast. Yeah, um, I mean, uh, you can think about the, like from mergers and acquisitions and apps merging and these things, it's the history of platforms. I mean, for some of us that are old enough, go back to Windows 3.1. Windows 3.1 came out and you get all these add-ons, you get like these toolbars and all these things for it. Then Windows 95 came out and all those add-ons were just kind of built in. And the same thing happened with uh, the iPhone. The iPhone comes out, it just had a plain old camera app and that was it. And you get all these apps to put filters and all the stuff now. And now the camera apps in Android and Apple, 
right? Just have mm -hmm. all these filters. It's just all built in. It's the history of platforms. So it's kind of the same thing like bill pay or, or actually OCR is the best example, right? Scanning yeah. of bills. Well, QuickBooks has built their own zero bought hub doc, stage bought auto entry, right? At the natural places, the accounts, so you're going to see more things that are features. So if there's a standalone app, that's really a feature of an accounting system. Those are going to get rolled up, either purchased or replaced, or they're going to build themselves, whatever it might be. It's the niche apps that are going to, where, where you solve a problem that a bigger fish is never going to solve. Those are the ones or, that are going to be yeah, around. It's too, or it's too, like it's too narrow, right? Like yeah, it would yeah. never if really, if, yeah. If you're building a feature of QuickBooks, yeah. eventually think, it's going to I be a feature a of QuickBooks. And who knows what the I, timeline is, a, but it will. I think a really good example that might put this in people's minds is like, I don't think Intuit or or Zero are ever going to build like a trust accounting system, like for lawyers, right? So that's where like Lean Law and Clio and those types of ones exist. Um, you know, I just I just can't see that Intuit or Zero would ever would ever do that because that that's just too narrow of a, you know. So yeah, well, there were a few comments that I'm not going to read out on on the basically company X Y Z purchases something and then the customer support goes down yeah. well i think one of That's the other a things, sad thing actually when that happens but what i think is really important and 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 i guess the big lesson here is like is when we can become over reliant on the technology and not on our own internal processes right mm -hmm. like we we've had our own issues with that you know with crms right like you you become so reliant on that backbone of that technology that you haven't stepped back to be like, okay, what are actually my processes? So that if, you know, this software disappears one day tomorrow, what do I have the ability to pivot and adapt that I can take my processes and apply them to a competitive platform or a similar type of platform and be, well, it's not important not to have that, you know, bright, shiny object syndrome, which I am definitely guilty of. You also have to be prepared to jump um, when you need to, right? And have yeah. the processes on the yeah. back end that aren't relying on the technology. Yeah, and I'm a big fan of like piloting something. Like you can pilot something, right? Take a few clients and pilot, see if it works. Yeah. David, did you have a comment? And uh, I, I was going to say, over. it's funny that you talk about that because we actually use, uh, Blake and I with our new company, we use Process Street very heavily. To some extent, our entire business is dependent on it. And so that is our processes. They're in that app. And like we talk about, so if that app goes away one day, like we're starting from scratch. Like, yeah, yeah. like we got we Document better start those processes. copying those yeah. like over in a Google Doc somewhere else somewhere because yeah. the process like the software is our process app like yeah. ultimately and, and doing yeah. the work. Process Street, everybody. I want to add quickly piggyback off of Don when she mentioned that like I'm not the shiny new object type person. Like when new app comes out, I'm not gonna jump around. I'm like, oh, that's cute, but I'm not gonna be like, oh, I'm about to try it out. For me, I pick apps based on a problem I have, so I'm looking for solutions based app versus yeah. next best thing. Yeah, yeah, that's a great, great. So now I want to ask. Um, there's a couple of questions that I'd love people to answer, all of you to answer in your own different way. There's two questions I'm going to ask that I think are just really, really good ones, and this is going to take us down a whole different path. So Shane says, "What would be your number one piece of advice for someone just putting out their their own shingle?" So that's one question. And then Michael asks, "It's easy to say no to new clients you don't know or clients you don't like." How do you say no to family members and friends? They are the biggest time suck of any client. So I don't mind who answers, but they kind of feel like they're related, right? Like when you're choosing your clients, who are you going to choose? And what would you guys advise? Like all of you are experts here. You've all been there and done that. What would you advise if you're putting out your own shingle? So for putting out your own shingle, I think the, the most important thing is to, um, spend the time defining who your ideal customer is, which is really hard at first because you don't really know until you get a customer or two to figure it out. But I think you really have to define that customer and really stick to it, which can be really, really, really hard in those early days when you kind of feel like, hey, I'm starting out, I need, to take, I need to take anybody and everybody. Um, but to the extent that you can really clearly define like who it is that you want to serve, what they look like, put together the mm -hmm. avatar of what that ideal client looks like, um, and stay focused to that, which can tie back into, hey, family and friends, sorry, I don't do that. I only do this, right? And that gives you a good way to say no to family and friends. Um, and yes, if you can avoid doing family and friends work, which often want it for free, I would strongly encourage it. Yeah. I yeah. could definitely answer that one. So um, in that area, um, 
I've be, like Andrew was saying, I love what you said about how we're just willing to take anything and do anything. A couple of things. One thing that I did do is I took myself out of the process. I took myself out of that piece and took the emotion away from, and it took the relationship of that family or friend out of the conversation. And I would say, okay, uh, you know, Sarah, you want to have us do your tax return? No problem. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to run you through the process that everyone else goes through. Tracy does this. Here we go. You get a proposal. You accept the proposal. We look at the return. Do your pricing based on the return, not the name on the return. And I give the same pricing to my, only my mother gets a free tax return. She's lucky. I tell her that every year, but it's like, listen, I, I don't ask you to come repair my car because you're my friend who works on cars. I don't ask you to ask you to come and do that for free for me. I'm not going to do the same. It's a business. I run my business. Yeah. And so I put that, I take the emotion out of it and I run them through the process that someone I wouldn't know. Same and, it's way. Not, and it's not you working with them. Yeah. And yeah. That's just, so, so then it just really, for pricing guys, that was one of my biggest, best things yeah. was to take the emotion out of it this is what I charge and I'm charging everyone the same. That's how it's going to be. So what do you guys think is going to happen to prices this year? You think they're going up? I did. Well, we'll, everybody's going up. Yep. Yep. Um, And what do you think is going to be the basis for like, you know, do you think you'll lose clients for it? Or do you think it'll be like, what, what, what do you think is going to happen when, when everybody raises prices? I was hoping I was his client, but that hasn't (laughs) been the reality yet. So I mean, yeah, I've been watching your, I've been watching your tweets about that. And you're like, they haven't left me yet. They just won't go away. So I'm like, okay, I got to raise prices again. I think, and I think that that's, I love, there were a bunch of people earlier in the chat. I love that people are in there chatting. That's so fun. But I, and I love the fact that some people said, and people are talking about Ron Baker's book. They're talking about, he, he calls it subscription pricing. I call it relationship pricing. It's the same thing. And I think that as we move in that direction, our purpose becomes bigger. Because, and, I, and a simple example, when you're having conversations, advisory work, everyone's all freaked out. Just talk to people. That's what it means. You just ask, ask a lot of questions and ask then you help them and you, help, and you advise them. It's not actually that complicated, but you charge them for it. And you charge them, you start to actually charge for your value yep. and the relationship you build with your clients. Like for me has been over the last three months, I've only been doing it and it has changed the relationship with my clients and we're getting paid for everything. And yep. that's, what's important. We've got to get paid. That's, this is the only thing we own right in this coconut. So do you think that as a group, do you think that folks are going to move to more sort of, I mean, value pricing has been around forever. So a lot of people are not, are just realizing that they're not going to bill hourly anymore. Um, but do you think we're going to be moving to this relationship pricing, which is which is uh, subscription based pricing, which is what Ron Baker basically what he says is that they will offer anything that they are able legitimately able to provide for a fixed I, price per month. I'm just going to say you're guys, doing it right. You've done it. You're doing it. We have 18. Cl- you know what it did for us? It was for me to be able to go to my staff. Okay, I don't have a big staff, but I went to my staff and I said, "How much do you want to make? What is, what is your what's your number?" What kind of what kind of hours do you want to work? And then we said, well, let's build this subscription for this relationship pricing model around what we want and what we can offer. And so we did that. We have 18 clients. We're billing $36,000 a month for three people. And we ha- we're not worried about money. Money isn't even a conversation right. anymore. And and we're being we're able we're doing more things with our clients and they're seeing the impact even something dumb and simple as we have partners that are 28 years old and they didn't have a will. And they didn't have a, a buy sell agreement. And I'm not doing them, but I'm let, saying, hey, we can get you to an attorney. I'm not doing that work. And they know they got to pay for but it. But you're at least flagging up that they need it. So you're using your expertise there to flag yeah. up what you need it. Yeah. So so are we making this prediction that more people are going to? 100%. Right? I think right? the shift will continue, but I don't think it's going to be a rapid, like a, a huge shift. I agree. In- in it's how a that process. Goes. If this doesn't happen overnight, I mean, it took me a year to put together what I was going to do and go through my mind. So maybe the start of it. I, I think it, well, I think it has started. I think it will continue, but I think it's still going to be the minority, not the majority. I think the majority mm-hmm. actually are still old school. Um, and I think that one of the things is we sometimes get in this bubble where we're all around people who are like-minded and we're all at that bleeding edge. Right. Um, but the, remember that the majority is behind us, but I think what we are at is there are going to be, we're, we're, in, we're headed into a storm here. 
And has everyone ever heard of the um, the the story of the the cows versus the water buffaloes? So the cows, when a storm comes, run from the run from the storm, and they run as fast and as far as they can from the storm. And the water buffalo charges headstrong into the storm, and they go through the storm fast and furious. They get to the other side, and they reap the rewards of all the rain and the water and the bounty that that you get from heading straight into the storm. Whereas the cows tire and get tired and tired because the storm doesn't stop. The storm continues to chase them. And you have an opportunity to choose whether you're going to head into the storm, adopt the new technology, adopt the new pricing models, shift to a new way of thinking around work-life balance, um, and reap the rewards at the other side of that storm. Because there is going to be work to be able to adopt the new technology, change your mind shift, change your mm -hmm. pricing. But you ultimately have to choose whether you're going to be a buffalo or a cow and decide whether you're heading into that storm, you're going to face it head on and you're going to reap the rewards of your hard work or whether you're going to run um, from these massive shifts. And, and I think that, in my opinion, these are the largest shifts that we've seen in our industry mm -hmm. with what's going on with the AI revolution, which is, to be honest, we, we haven't even really touched the surface of what that is. And ChatGPT is freaking massive and it's going to spawn a whole bunch of new information and content that's going to come out and how we're going to watermark that content to know it was AI generated is a whole big question. Uh, but that's also going to spawn a whole bunch of new technology because what ChatGPT can do is it can actually help people who have always had an idea for an app or a product to now be able to build yeah. and launch that. And I know, Nicole, I convinced you not to launch a piece of technology um, yes. <laughs> because there are some other things. But what I yeah. think we're going to see over the next year is like if we had app overload before, forget about it. It's going to be 10 times worse. And what we're going to have is we're going to have a plethora of apps that are going to be half-assed developed too. Um, and it's going to become harder and harder to sort. And I think, you know, David, you guys talked about in your episode of predictions about having that bullshit meter. And our bullshit meters are really going to need to go up 110 fold yeah. for sifting through the crap of all the content that we're going to see that's going to be generated by AI, but also the crap of all the technology that's going to come out as yeah. a result of, of yeah, the, the, the real skill is you have to have is the ability to identify crap that's been made by AI. That's that is going to be the skill. Like you need somebody on your staff to see that. We've got to get well, Jason in here. Talking yeah. about being yeah. able to watermark. Jason, come off heard. mute, please, because yeah. we've got to get the chat. It's blown up with with. <laughs> I want to hear about how Jason does pricing, and I also want to hear what is the best use of of Chat GPT. You've actually played around with it quite a lot. And you've actually got it to do things, but you have the trick is in knowing how to ask, isn't it? Like it's, knowing it's very much a learned skill right now. And so it will get it will get better. Um, but it is very much a learned skill. Um, the novelty of Chat GPT is for the first time anybody could, in a very rudimentary way, train their own model. Like, and that's that's not a new thing. Developers have been able to do that for a while, but when yeah. anybody could say like low code or no code, right? How do you do it, right? Yeah. Well, not even that, just narratively. So like Narrative, once anybody yeah. can say, I have a CSV in this format, I need it in this format, I'm going to explain verbally how to do it and then save this conversation and come back here every month to convert that file. Like that, I think was what really it was opened pretty mind blowing eyes. to me when I saw you do that. That was because pivoting, because creating, taking those two files that you took that were very different formats and making them, walking them through what you were going to do with this thing and then also giving it the role that it was playing. thought that was yeah. really, really interesting. Um, folks, if you haven't, um, Jason has a whole thread on that on his Twitter. Um, uh, I don't know, Jason, if you have the thread, you could post it in the chat, but you probably don't have it. Um, but that was really, really eye-opening for me was how how once Jason figured it out. Now, how long did it take you, though, to do that? Like, be be honest here. That was That was quite a bit of time, wasn't it, to figure it out? Honestly, not really, but it was it was more the cumulative the fact of that I've spent more time doing things on Chat GPT than most people have. And so I've under yeah. I've got an understanding of how to keep it from giving me the boilerplate. Ah, I can't answer that question because I'm not a tax expert. I, like it, it comes down to the I can't the, make a prediction because I can't yeah. see in the future or yeah. Yeah. So like the the phrasing of the prompts, like being able to build reusable things, like uh it is a learned skill right now. And so like just like with any software, the easier it is to use, the better, right? Yeah. But, you know, I, I tell people right now, assume AI written text generation is going to be built into browsers. Like I would mm -hmm. be surprised if it's it not. And so basically just 
approach what you do through that lens. But I mean, there's, there's, there's still a ton of compelling ways to use it for writing from training it to be your editor. Like that would be valuable, right? If every time you had a blog post before you did that blog post, you say, I want you to be an editor with this style and keep iterating on that style. Check at that blog post, see if it has any feedback. Say, how can I make this sound more authoritative or friendly? Like I think there's a lot of ways to still use it around that. Can I ask you a question about this and, and, and what people, how we think, if it's going to be in browsers, which we know Bing has invested or Microsoft has invested $10 billion already, and it's going to be in Bing. It's already been announced that it will be in Bing. So if people are now searching um, using chat TPT, how will that affect the value of content creation and blogging? Because right now blogging is being done as a tool to generate traffic um, through the web to generate leads. Because I kind of think that that's going to go the way of the dinosaur real fast because you're never going to read another blog article again if you've got chat GPT built into the browser because you're going to be able to find the specific answer you want as well as dive deeper than any blog that you've ever been in. So does that change the way people should be focusing on their content generation strategy and their search engine optimization strategy right now? Because that's been the big thing over the last few years is content, 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 got to get your blogs, you got to post on on sites, you got to get your backlinks, you got to drive SEO traffic that way. I think that's going to really fundamentally change in the next year as Bing rolls out ChatGPT. I think love you're going to be what... looking at more live content versus versus the written stuff myself. That's my prediction. Well, video is going to be become yep. important as well. And I mean, figuring out how to work with how you get mm-hmm. ranked on an engine that's got ChatGPT built to do mm-hmm. it will be a whole nother ball of wax. I think social strategies like Twitter and Instagram and TikTok will become more and more important. I think the ideas of driving traffic through blog posts though um, and backlinks will become less relevant, but I'm curious what everyone else thinks. I definitely agree with the video. Go ahead, Jason. Yeah, a couple thoughts on that. Um, there's, it definitely casts some question around SEO and um, the future may look more like not how do I get my Google search results to rank, but how do I get myself into the language model itself? So mm. if people are coming to language models to answer questions, that's where you want to be, right? That yeah. being said, the only reason to write blog posts is not necessarily SEO, right? You know, if somebody asks you the same question three times, probably time to write a blog post about it and just link that out for the next hundred times you get asked that question. But again, um, if you're able to use chat GPT, just to play devil's advocate here, Jason, I literally already had set up chat GPT to auto respond to emails with responses to questions that they can go and pull from chat GPT and get the answer yeah. automatically. Do you even need to have canned answers and canned posts if you can get dynamic real time answers? If they're accurate, though, I think somebody brought accurate. up if they're accurate. So that's the only yeah. thing is like, mm, you know, I'm looking forward to like Jason, for example, you creating like a product where people can go and sort of buy the the prompts to put in but but i'm also mindful that microsoft you know just poured 10 billion dollars into chat gpt and or ai the ai company whatever they called open ai um so i think that model is going to change dramatically yeah so we've got a couple minutes left i'd like each of my experts here so first of all i can't believe how fast that hour went like oh my gosh thank you all so much i'd like to just go what is your number one prediction for 2023 just put you on the spot and um, whoever's ready to go first, just their number one prediction that people need to be aware of and thinking about in their practices and maybe their personal, well, let's just, let's just limit it to practices in the industry. So who wants to go first? Number one prediction. I'll be drunk at QB Connect. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So, let's, let's have a business one. Yeah, business one. Um, so I think la- labor issues will continue to play uh, a big problem. I, it's hard for me to narrow it down to one. It, it still really goes back to the three areas of technology that I'm going to be focusing on. Uh, I think that there will be no shortage of clients. Um, Prices will continue to go up. Um, Issues around staffing will continue to play a a big role. Uh, One of the things, I don't know if any of you guys heard about it, there was a major case up here in Canada by an accounting firm for the very first time who was successful. Oh, yes, uh, sued for wrongful dismissal and they countersued for theft of hours thanks to technology and one and the client and the former staff had to pay the employer $5,000 or or whatever it was. Yeah. I I think that labor issues are still going to pay a major part on that. 
And that's why I think technology will need to come in to fill some of that void and the staffing issues. Okay. We'll also have to focus on people and technology and training. People. Okay. All right. Who would add? Let's see. What, 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 Don, what's your, see if you can limit it to one. Andrew, thank you. That was awesome. But let's see. We've got, a, we've got like a minute left. I personally think it's the, it's the year for people to transform their practice in whatever capacity that means, whether it means niching, niching, whatever, if it means uh, relationship pricing, if it means wh whatever it means to them, I see a change in the way people look and observe and define their practices this year. Yeah. It's time to make it happen. I think this is the year to make it, to make it. Awesome. Um, David, one prediction. It's the year of no. You're just going to have to, you're going to tell no. clients no than you've ever done yeah. before. You're going to say okay. no all the time. Okay, Nicole. Um, I definitely think, oh my gosh. Like, I think Andrew took all the ones I was going to talk you about. You can agree. Um, you can say, oh, yeah, it doesn't have to be different. It can okay, be the same. Be different. I think for me, it's definitely going to be the year where more smaller firms get comfortable with offshoring when they see that capacity. Offshoring, yeah. We didn't actually even cover that, did we? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, offshoring, absolutely. So uh, look for TOA, look for Money Penny. There's a bunch of really awesome offshoring companies that you can go through. Uh, Jason, can give you the last word. I mean, I think AI is just going to dominate the headlines in a similar way that desktop to cloud during that transition period yeah. that, that we're, I don't know, probably still in. Um, like, yeah. you know, kind of separated thought leadership and software leaders in that new domain versus the previous domain. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much. I just want to give a shout out to our next uh, big webinar that we're doing, which is, um, and David's going to be um, co-moderating on it, um, on The Grove, which is QBO, Zero, or Both, What Firm Leaders Need to Know. Apparently I am now. I haven't committed yet, but now I'm committed. Oh, so. I, I thought you had committed. Yeah, <laughs> It's happening now. It's, okay. There's a prediction that David will commit. <laughs> to, to co moderate with Blake. And we have Hector Garcia and Amanda Aguilard. And the idea is just to really discuss um, really kind of what each, what firm, firm leaders really do, do need to know about using each each software in their practice. So well, we need there's to throw a, in an extra one. We need, you got to throw in fresh books because they're, they're climbing up. You know what? We should do that for the next one. We will. <laughs> We will. Yeah, I'm happy to do it. I'm not sure we can pull it in for this time, but yeah. So the, the link is in the chat. I'm going to have Katie sh share that one more time so that it's there. Do register for that because these, 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 these webinars tend to be really fun and you never know where they're going to go. And thank you all to my uh, awesome panelists. I'm going to put you on the spot and make you all smile so I can get a screenshot. And then we're going to, or make a face. Ready? All right. Excellent. All right. That is going out on social and you guys are going to laugh. <laughs> All right, everyone. Thank you so much for your time. You're engaged with your fantastic questions. And we will send out, we will make all this available on the Grove. You'll see, you can get the recording. Um, there's no PowerPoint deck, but we'll see if we can send you a copy of the chat. Actually, we'll see if we can do that. So thanks everybody. Have a, have a wonderful, wonderful day. See everybody soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.